Good morning. Good morning. Who is about to take a nap after that breakfast? <laughs> yeah, everyone's going to be snoozing. Yeah. Well, you cooked it. People are going to be snoozing soon. Um, in your bulletin, we have a discipleship opportunities brochure because our new year gets kicked off uh, next Sunday with Sunday school and some of the new groups starting. So that's the brochure. And it's really convenient that you can hand it to somebody else if you want somebody else to know when Sunday school and other things start. Um, and take a moment, if you will, to look through your bulletins and things that are, are happening. Um, again, next Sunday we start Sunday school, so we'll join together at 9 a.m. for that. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for fellowship and for friends and for being able to come a little early and to celebrate what you have laid on our heart for classes next year. Lord, we pray for uh, that time. Pray for the ways that you will open us up to your word. Pray for the ability to kind of cancel out the things that take our attention away, getting us here for Sunday school. And Lord, just pray for that time this coming year to be protected. And Lord, now as we Turn our attention to you this morning in praise and in worship. We ask your Holy Spirit to move about this room, to fill us with your joy and your love and your hope. Allow us, when we leave here in a little bit, Father, to be changed, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our service of worship this morning. May the Lord bless you through this time. You who are loved in God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit, mercy, peace, and love be with you in abundance. And also with you. Please rise for our call to worship. People of God, thank the Lord. Praise his name. Tell the nations what he has done. Let them know how he how might let them know how mighty he is. We will sing to the Lord, for he has done wonderful things. We will make known his praise around the world. Let the people shout and praise with joy, for great is the Holy One of Israel who lives among you. Please open your hymn books to hymn number ten, O Worship the King. Thank mm.
Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Yeah. 
together in prayer. Oh Lord, we lift your name on high. We think of you in those watches of the night when no one else is around but you are, Lord. Thank you are, that you are with us through the highs and lows. Lord, we just lift your name in praise and give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. Learning to Pray by my friend Abigail Carroll. When I say I've passed the afternoon watching loose strife lean against the wind at the edge of the lake, what I mean is I have stepped into prayer, not unlike Peter stepping out of the boat, and it has held me, as prayer does, like a child holds a penny or fern holds beads of dew. When slippage occurs, as it is wont to do, and I begin to sink through unraveling molecules of faith like a dream sink, sinks back into dark when dawn dissolves the net of sleep. I am caught by a quiet grip, an open palm, the way air catches a parachute or a June buttercup catches light. And there is in that catching a new kind of drowning, not unpleasant, though it surprises at first. It's like losing yourself to an embrace in which the more you are lost, the more surely you are found. It's like the flood of sun on the map of your skin into your cells and the spaces between your cells, sewing you into its warmth, which you realize is singing. How often have I stood at the edge of the lake gazing, wholly unsure what it means to pray, but willing to step out, willing to go down, slip through the watery blue particles, precisely to be caught, recovered, salvaged, again and again, to know once more that hand. time in our service where we get to pray for one another. We'll start off in a moment in silence, and then I'll pull us together in prayer, and we'll close in the Lord's Prayer. This week for our brothers and sisters who are Jewish is Rosh Hashanah, which is the new year. Rosh means top, and, uh, or head, and Shana is year. And um, though we celebrate the new year in January, it kind of feels like a new year in the fall, right? School starting, college students will all be back next week. Um, kids have gone back into school. Our newlyweds are back in town from their travels. So it feels like this excitement of newness happening. Um, and so my plea again for you is to uh, take this opportunity and look for a class or a group or something new this year to get involved in in discipleship. Even if you're, oh, I've read everything, I've done everything, I've been everywhere, it's okay. Then lend your voice to a group that, that needs that information. Um, and so as we kick off this new year, pray for it. Lord, where, where do you want me to serve? What do you want me to be? What class can I help people in or what class can I benefit from? Uh, we've been praying over the last several uh, summer months on that four o'clock prayer time for our students, for you, for our teachers, for our leaders. Uh, this has been bathed in prayer. And we're continuing to just lift this time up to the Lord. Let's go to the Lord. We'll start again in silence and I'll, I'll pull us together for prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the chance to have classes, to study you, and to, to worship you, to be able to do that in freedom without fear of persecution. And then we know that we actually have a choice to show up 
uh, for Sunday school or not, or to be involved in the class or not, where so many of our Christian brothers and sisters all over the world don't have that opportunity. They face immense persecution for deciding to study your word. And so, Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we have, and we lift up those who are, who are being persecuted, who are in fear this morning of worshiping you and what retribution that will bring them. Lord, we take this opportunity to, to hand you our whole world, which is yours anyway, uh, in, in a way that reminds us that you are in charge, that you are in control. And so we, we lift over to you and hand over to you the places in our world where there is violence, where there's destruction, where there's natural disasters going on. We lift up uh, places like Haiti and North Korea and Yemen and Puerto Rico and, and places where um, I will confess I might get on with my day and, and, and not have to live in what they live in. And so it's easy to forget to pray. And so, Lord, we, we hand them over to you. Pray for ways, Lord, that we can very intentionally grow in you this year. We pray for you to speak to us about classes, to convict us in a wonderful way, not in shame and guilt, but just a knowledge, a desire that we need to be in your word. We need to be in your presence every day of our lives. And so, Lord, allow us to carve out opportunities for that to happen this year. We know as we pray that, then it is, it's really easy to fill up our lives with so many things that take that out. And so, Father, we pray intentionally to be mindful of the time we have this year, to put you as a priority, uh, to proclaim you without fear or embarrassment, and to be able to be put in intentional places where we can speak your name and your word into a hurting world. Lord, we pray for those in our congregation who are ailing, whether physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, or perhaps all of the above. Pray for ways, Lord, that we can walk beside our brothers and sisters in our community, ways that we can help minister to, help bring change and hope. And Lord, we pray for uh, those who are not here today. Pray for those who aren't in any church today. Maybe it's, it's a hurt or a fear or it just feels like an insurmountable wall to climb. Pray for ways, Lord, for avenues to be opened up so that your word can penetrate all of our community and our town and our state and our country, Lord. And we thank you that it is a new year in many ways. It's a new year for us in, in education. It's coming back together after a summer of being apart for many of us. And we pray for the college students coming in. We pray for our college students from here that have gone on to to colleges and are experiencing the first few weeks of school, or just be with them, allow them to find a church home and to feel your presence with them, we pray. We ask all these things in your name as we pray the prayer you've taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time I'll ask the ushers to wait upon you for this morning's tithes and offerings.
reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in his way, dear friends. I plead with Judea and I plead with Sintaichi to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help those women since they have content contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Final exhortations. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. This is the word of the Lord. We're almost done with the letter to the church in Philippi. When we were doing the Jeremiah sermon series, um, I said when we got to Jeremiah 29 11 that it was pretty safe to say that was the most well known, most loved verse in, in Jeremiah. And I think it's safe to say that we've come to a similar place in the book of Philippians. Everybody loves this verse. Now it's tucked in verses 1 through 8, but verses 4, 5, and 6 we love. I, I keep it on a card. Raynan made this. Looks like a psychology test, does it not? Um, but this is, this is one of my favorites, right? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's one of those that we kind of know by heart. I keep it in my Bible so I can pull it out because it's, it's a wonderful reminder um, of hope, of comfort, and it's also a gentle push towards a different perspective on life. And I don't have that naturally, so I need to have that with me at all times so I can pull it out and read it and be reminded that we as Christians are supposed to be different. Not only should we act in a way that varies from the culture around us, we should speak in a way that is an alternative to the vernacular of, all, of our culture. And we should have an outlook that is different to our world, that is a counter to the despondent and often negative outlook of our worldview. When that doesn't happen, though, when what we claim to believe doesn't match up with what we do, then that word hypocrite get circled around the church and in our community about the difference between what Christians say they believe and what they actually do. Now, we think of hypocrite as a buzzword, but it's really not a postmodern or modern phenomenon. Paul writes a lot about this throughout the books, not just to the church in Philippi, but to Corinth and to Ephesus. Jesus talked about this disconnect between what we believe and how we act. Remember that whole issue with the Pharisees being hypocrites? It's an age-old problem because it is difficult to be counter to what is around us in the world. 
particularly when how we are to act counter to our culture means that we're probably not going to have as many friends or be as popular or be as powerful or be as wealthy. And so the temptation then is to just return to what is natural and normal and like everybody else. But when we do that, there is no discernible difference between those who claim to serve Jesus Christ and those who don't. One of my favorite authors um, is a, a woman whose name is Phyllis Tickle. I love that name. Makes you giggle every time you hear Phyllis Tickle. Uh, Phyllis Tickle's deceased. She died a few years ago. But she was, she was, a, she was kind of a cultural anthropologist when it came to all things religious. And she wrote this book called Emergent Christianity, How Christianity is Changing and Why. And in the book, she argues that about every 500 years, the church, capital C church, not our little church, but the big church, has kind of a rummage sale of sorts. Now, this doesn't mean that NBC is getting together and we're selling our grandmother's lamp. It means that this rummage sale is a purging of ideologies and habits that have infiltrated the church. This doesn't mean that people get together and try to figure out what do we need to get rid of in order to grab more people into the church. No, these rummage sales happen on average about 500 years when the culture of the world has infiltrated the church and the church looks more like the culture than the church and the church has to purge some of these ideologies. Now, Phyllis Tickle will argue that every single religious movement that we have seen since the time of Christ has been housed within a various cultural perspective. So she's not arguing that we are to be anti-culture. She's saying that we should not be influenced unduly by the culture. Karl Barth, in his book Dogmatics, will say a similar train of thought. He'll say that whenever we have cultural movements in our world, the church should discuss them. We should talk about them internally. We should not, however, be influenced by them. The church should influence culture. When that doesn't happen, when, when culture unduly influences the church, then you have these kind of tsunamis of rummage sales. And, and one of the most well-known and famous is that one that took place with Martin Luther when he tacked on to the door in uh, 1517 his 95th thesis. By the way, Karl Barth will say of that that it was less a reformation and more a schism because very little actually got reformed with the reformation. But what happened with Martin Luther is that the culture of the day, the feudal system, and the pay to play, and the inequality in wealth and distribution of that was infiltrating the church. And so what was happening? There was indulgences being sold. So greed and money were making way for sin to come into the church, and it was sucking the life out of the people who were supposed to serve Jesus Christ. So that priests who are selling away to heaven, if you got enough money, you can pay to play, was completely annihilating what it meant to serve Jesus Christ. Um, that may sound a little bit heady this morning, but I think we're coming upon another one of those right now. What we're watching taking place in the Catholic Church with the recent and, and ongoing sexual abuse scandal feels like one of those times. It feels like one of those times where it's very easy to say about our Catholic brothers and sisters, that's their problem. But the same thing happens in Protestant churches as well. When you have a system of power that is unchecked, and culture says this is what power looks like, what happens then is sexual abuse. And in order for the Catholic Church to be able to purge itself of that, it's going to have to have some major systematic changes. It's going to have to have a reversal of, of a check on accountability. It's going to have to have some purging of things and a willingness to tell the truth. This is one of those schisms, as Bart says, or as Tickle calls, one of those reformation moments happening. And it happens when... The culture bleeds into the church, as opposed to the church bleeding into the culture. Okay, so if you're sitting here today and you're saying to yourself, what does this have to do with me? And when can I get back to that lovely verse? Hold on. We'll get there. Paul is writing this final exhortation to the church in Philippi because he's trying to caution them 
against the very same thing that Phyllis Tickle's talking about. He knows there's not only persecution and dissension and false teachers, but there is a Roman and Greco-Roman culture that is threatening to suck the life out of the church. And he wants them to be able to be equipped with some resources. The resources that he gives us in verses 1 through 8 are the same resources we need in order to serve Jesus Christ in our culture today. These don't change. We like to contextualize all things scripture, but these things do not change. And there's four. They're going to be on the board. The first is the steadfastness we have in our faith. The second is how we treat one another. The other is how we react to trials and to the world. And the last one is what we choose to focus on. If we're going to be able to serve Christ throughout culture, and to not be anti-culture and not to be overrun by culture, then we need to be able to land on certain tenets. And I think these four things, they're true in Paul's day and they're true in ours. Steadfastness in our faith, how we treat one another, um, how we react to trials and to the world, and what we choose to focus on. So let's look back at our passage and let's start with that first one, our steadfastness in faith. Look at, if you look at verse 1 in chapter 4, Paul begins by saying, Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Just stop there for one second. Remember last week we said that Paul is arguing for us to win the crown, and the crown is Jesus, right? For Paul, this little church in Philippi is his crown. He's, he's prayed for them. He's ministered to them. So he says, uh, stand firm. This is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Stand firm. Um, Stand firm is the steadfastness that Paul is going to talk about the themes from verses 1 through 9. And it's housed within this major theme that he's had throughout the book, and that is rejoice. So Paul is now turning his attention to how you rejoice is this steadfastness. This term stand firm in Greek is the word steko, and steko is a military term. Stecco means that you hold your position when you're coming under fire. Now, primarily, Roman combat is hand-to-hand, -hand, primarily, but it means that you're immovable in your position. It doesn't mean that you're stubborn. It means that you hold your position when you're coming under fire. Now, Philippi is settled primarily by retired Roman soldiers, and so they're going to know what stecco means. You hold firm. To stand firm in our faith means that we stand in our testimony of Jesus Christ and we do not allow it to waver no matter what the cultural tides are. I've said this over and over again every single week, but Paul is writing this from prison. Paul, of all people, is modeling for them what it means to stand firm. He has spent two years in a prison in Judea, when the council wouldn't hear his case, he pleads to Caesar, and he is transferred to Rome. The journey to Rome almost kills him. It is a harrowing journey. He makes it to Rome, and he gets under house arrest, which is a little bit of an upgrade from a prison in Judea, but he's chained to a human being 24 hours a day, and he cannot leave the house. And if that's not bad enough, there's Christians within his purview that are seeking to undercut him and to put him down and to do him in. He is having onslaught of attacks on every side and so when he is saying stand firm in your faith he knows of what he speaks he's saying to them do not be moved no matter what comes against you okay how do we do this in application in our culture today how do we stand immutable against whatever comes our way i think one of the things we often sell this as is just to be out of culture Right? We can stand firm in our faith if we never, ever, ever interact with culture. Well, that's not what Paul is arguing for. One of the selling points of the first church, and I've said this so many times, is that they got involved in culture. They adopted those babies people neglected. They nursed people who were ridden by the plague whose family left. They got involved in their culture. So Paul's not arguing for us to be anti-culture. How we stand firm in our faith is we don't allow the world to interpret our faith for us. We allow our faith to interpret the world. Karl Barth, one of his great quotes, says, you're supposed to read the Bible and read the newspaper 
and then you interpret the newspaper through the Bible. What does he mean by that? That we interpret the world through the Word of God. We don't look at the world and then say, now let me interpret the Word of God based on the world. If we're going to be able to stand firm in our testimony, and I don't mean to sound snarky here, if we have to stand on the Word of God, it means we actually have to know the Word of God. One of the reasons God's words get obliterated and misused in justifying horrific things is because most of us don't know it cover to cover. I don't mean just repeating memory verses. I mean saturated in it so that we can say, you know what, that's not consistent all the way through. That we know how to. Those, those um, litmus tests I've talked to you about, about praying through, allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us, understanding what the contextual is, the particular and the universal, allowing ourselves to be so saturated with it that that is the light through which we look at all else. Paul is saying the same thing to the church in Philippi. Know the word. Pray. Stand firm in that. Okay, next up he says uh, how we should be different is how we treat one another. So there's some kind of conflict going on between two women. And thank you, Deb, for pronouncing their names. <laughs> no one's ever going to read if we have to make them say Greek and Hebrew words. But these two women are having some kind of argument. And we don't know what the argument is about. We don't really know a whole lot of specifics, except that he has appealed, Paul's appealed to the church to help them work out this situation. Um, by the way, the evidence of these two women, and I don't think this is small uh, potatoes to overlook, he is complimenting these two women on their contribution to the gospel. So remember the first week I told you people either love Paul or they hate Paul, and one of the reasons they don't like him is because they think he has this really adverse in not respect for women. This is one of those passages that says, no, 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 the whole Bible doesn't say that. He is actually commending them for upholding the gospel for their work in missionaries. But they've gotten into some kind of squabble. And so what he's appealing to is this unity, this same-mindedness that he talks about in Philippians 2. In Philippians 2, he says we should be united and we should have the same mind in Jesus Christ. And then he appeals, and that's a general. He gives a specific in chapter 4. But then he appeals to the church as a whole to hold these women accountable to work it out. He has this companion, this person that he's friends with, who we don't really know more specifics, that he's also asking to help work this situation out so that there is unity in the church in Philippi. When there is discord, when there are fractions that do not get resolved, it undermines the service of the gospel. It tears apart. It is a crack that easily can be misused and abused by the enemy. Unity is important. It is, it is incredibly important for us to be able to stand firm in our faith, is to be able to have unity as brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, what does that mean in actual terms? Paul is, is not telling us that this unity means that we're tiny little clones of one another and that we all think the same thing and we all like the same thing and we all do the same thing. Unity doesn't mean that we're robots. It means that we're unified in our goal, and our goal is service to Jesus Christ. That's the lens through which we look at all things. And so our desire to be harmonious in relationship with one another is because we are serving the goal of Jesus Christ. That is the common goal of all of us as Christians. And so our actions should be different. The way that we resolve disputes should be different. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor, I've been a pastor for 20 years, there have been people who have been irritated by something that I have said or something that they thought I said, and they don't come talk to me, they talk around me, right? And I say this all the time, my friends. I'm the only one who can answer for me. You're the only one who can answer for you. When people have come to me and said, so-and-so did this, can you talk to them? No, I can't. You talk to them. Jesus Christ says in Matthew 18, 15, he gives this outline for what conflict resolution looks like in a church, and it is different than the world. He says if you have a problem with each other, prayerfully, prayerfully. How many times do we pray before we launch off at somebody? 
prayerfully go to them. And then he outlines, if that doesn't work, it will end with brothers and sisters in Christ coming together to deal with the situation. The goal of Matthew 18 is not retribution, it's resolution. We are to be different. The culture that we live in right now, every single day of our life, we have an onslaught of negativity. Not just lies and hates and meanness, but it is socially acceptable to say whatever you want to say, particularly if you're on social media. My goodness, we have a term now called trolls to outline what this means and who has permission to do it. We have a culture where we are socially accepted if we blow up at people or if our feelings make us think that we have a reason to go after somebody else. As Christians, we are commanded to be different. Paul is saying, ladies, we're going to fight, but we have to have reconciliation. We should not, as Christians, blow up at each other. We should not talk down to each other. We should not belittle each other. We should not gossip. We should not talk behind each other's backs. We should not undercut or seek to benefit when our brothers and sisters are put down. And if we have a problem with one another, we should prayerfully be able to go to one another and say it respectfully and lovingly because what's our goal? Unity and service in Jesus Christ. So we should be able to work it out. And if we can't work it out, if there is an inability to have reconciliation, then we should be grown-ups and be able to minister and work alongside each other without being awkward or putting each other down. We are to be different. So Paul is commanding them, he's calling upon that to be different so that the world will know we're Christians by our love. Okay, the next piece is how we should react to trials in the world, and this is our verse. He says to rejoice. Rejoice. This is a command. This is an imperative in the Greek. Rejoice, he says. Rejoice. Again, I say, in all things, in all times, rejoice. Paul is imprisoned in one of the most brutal regimes. These are the people that used crucifixion as a deterrent. So he knows of what he speaks when he says rejoice. Because he, even in that situation, in prison, has felt the nearness of God. He knows, just like joy, we talked about this a few weeks ago, rejoice means that you are choosing, independent of your circumstances, to praise God. Rejoice really means to sing for joy. That's the unpacking of the word rejoice. And it means we're choosing to praise God, independent of our circumstances. And he knows this is difficult. He follows it up with, do not be anxious about anything. But in all things, the big things and the small things, go to God. Lay them at his feet. Now, oftentimes we'll misquote this passage and we'll say it means something like, you know, you're giving Santa your wish list. And whatever you do, God's just going to grant it. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying we don't have to be anxious about anything because we know that God's will will be done in all things. And so he's choosing to rejoice. When we talked about joy, I said he knows, he does not know if he's going to live or die, but he knows that it's not going to end well pretty soon. Um, and yet he is choosing to have joy because he knows his relationship with God is the focus of what he's doing. Um, we have to do the same thing. You have to choose. A dear friend said to me this week that to choose this is an invitation and a choice. It's an invitation and a choice. When we're presented with situations that are horrible, and those are the trials of this world, we will not look any different if all we do is respond with vengeance, bitterness, anger, worry, and hurt. You can have those feelings, but if we stay there, we're not going to look any different than the world around us. I shared a couple of weeks ago with the Sunday School, the worship team, the decision that um, why we named Raynan Raynan. And uh, uh, Raynan is our fourth child. For those who don't know, he's seven. Um, Ranin in Hebrew means to rejoice. Um, it's spelled Rosh Olive Nun Nun instead of Nun. We took out one of the N's, two Nuns. We took out an N to maintain that five letter thing we got with our kids. So there was this point in the pregnancy with Raynan where I knew I had to make a choice to praise God because that pregnancy was horrible. 
So Rainin was going to be Rainin, whether he was a boy or a girl. We didn't know a gender until Rainin popped out. Um, but it was a really, really difficult pregnancy. It was a difficult pregnancy because I had gestational diabetes in the middle of it. You all know that story. Um, I was running the church at the time because my dear friend and boss, Martin, was sick. He was having radiation therapy at the time. So I was run down. I was tired. I would have daily pity parties for myself. Because I would have to prick myself, preach, prick myself, preach, praise Jesus, I didn't have to use insulin, but I'd have to take my blood sugar. And, and I felt like a failure. You know, I remember getting that diagnosis and sitting in the parking lot of Kaiser Permanente in Cleveland and thinking, what did I do wrong? Like, I eat really clean. I work out. Um, and so there was, this, there was this defining moment in that pregnancy where I realized I have to choose to rejoice. I have to choose it. Because just like Paul says about this, it was ripe to be beset with anxieties. You know, all pregnancies have anxieties, but when you have a high-risk one, it just doubles it. Boy, God knew what he was doing, right? The labor was worse than the, than the pregnancy. Um, Raymond had this giant knot most of you have heard about. He tied himself into a, a knot, literally. His umbilical cord was tied into a knot about this big, and he had turned himself um, graciously by God the wrong way, which meant that unlike Cohen, he didn't shoot out, because if he had shot out, it would have pulled the cord and he would have lost his oxygen. So he was turned in this really awkward position and they had to turn him inside me when I was in the end stages of labor. And I was able to say this name over and over again. Isaiah 35 two is where I got the name Rainin from. It says, and it shall blossom abundantly. It's talking about Israel. Carmel and Sharon specifically, and it shall blossom abundantly, and it shall shout out and rejoice with joy and singing. Um, and Raina did. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, that no, little knot, giant knot, we decided to bank with the Cleveland Cord Bank because it was so large they thought somebody could use it for treatment for cancer. And so when Raina was five, he got the phone call that asking permission to use that cord for a little boy or a little girl who had cancer. But Raynan, since giving birth to him, there's been many times where, and again, you guys know all these stories, but he's had allergies we've had to discover, he's had sensory issues we've had to discover, but there is this very visible reminder when I look at him, he's like an Ebenezer to me. It's a reminder to choose to rejoice, to choose to rejoice. That is something every single one of us as Christians, we need those visible reminders. And so Paul is saying, look, there's nothing natural about this. You have to choose this, especially in the times we could be overrun by anxiety. And that testimony leads us to this last point, what we choose to focus on. Look at what Paul says to focus on. Whatever is true, verse 8, whatever is noble, whatever is right, I like that. That's the daikacha in Hebrew, which means um, right understanding. Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Does that sound kind of like Pollyanna thoughts? Like you're just going to talk yourself into good things? Maybe, if you didn't know about the resurrection. Paul is holding two ideals in tension in this last verse, and he's telling us to be intentional about what we choose to keep our mind on. Rome was a horrific place to be. It was always at war with something or someone at its border. That's how it expanded the Roman Empire. Every single day in Rome, there was some kind of war being fought. And if you look around our world, the same thing is true today. Open the newspaper and you will see some kind of warring faction, somebody seeking to tear somebody else down. So on one hand, Paul is acknowledging that the world is bad around him. And if that were the only lens through which you looked, you would never be able to focus on what is right and what is noble and what is powerful and what is good. That's not the only lens through which Paul is looking. He's looking through the lens of the resurrection. And he knows that life is good because of the resurrection. But notice here, he's telling you that you have to be intentional about this. This is just like rejoicing. This, is, this takes a mental exercise as much as it takes a heart exercise. You have to choose 
to be disciplined, to focus on what is right and what is good and what is pure and what is holy. How do you do that? You hold intention like Bart said, the paper with the word of God. If all we read was the newspaper every single day, you would think the world was a terrible place. Yes, there are some terrible things, but we know because we hold an intention with the Bible that God is good and he is on the throne and we can make changes into this world. Paul is looking through this intentionally and he's telling us this is an exercise with your mind as much as your heart. This is not natural but every single day we are to focus in prayer and petition on what is good and what is holy and what is right. How do we do that in our world? Do what Paul did. Make a choice every single day. We don't neglect looking at the bad because of this. We just house the bad in the house of the resurrection. It's the lens through which we look at. Yes, Jesus' coming didn't end war and poverty and death, but it changed how we looked at it. And Paul's telling us, look at it with that lens. One day, Jesus promised, it will change it. It will end it. But in the meantime, this is the hope we have to proclaim. And lastly, look how he ends. He says, all of this allows us to have a peace that passes all understanding. <laughs> That's a tall order. For a man in jail in one of the most brutal regimes rome not only was constantly at war peace pax romana was not something anybody who was subject to the perils of rome understood now tacitus who was a roman senator who was stationed in one of the far-flung providence he says that rome's plan is to bring dissolution and then they call it peace no one in rome understood peace but Paul's saying the kind of peace that we have doesn't come from Caesar. It comes from our Lord who's already settled. It comes from our Lord who's already conquered death. We're not called to be separatist. We're called to engage. We're called to be different. And we're called to reflect our Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, as we go into a time of silence, we ask you to give us new eyes. To give us not only a heart for you, but a way to see the world as you do, Lord. Amen. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. 
the latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And all lift our voices together in rejoicing with this final hymn, 228, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Mm -hmm. Gracious Lord, take us now into your world. Allow those who look upon us to see you in us, we pray. Amen. Amen. 